Today is a really fun day. I'm excited about my interview with Kim Vopney and talking all about our vaginas. So welcome, Kim, to the new mid. Thank you very much, Michelle. Nice to be here. Well, it's funny because before we started talking in the green room, I was telling her that this is a little uncomfortable for me. I mean, I'm a good Catholic girl, and this is not something that we talk about. And I jokingly told her, because this podcast also airs on the radio station, the Eagle 106.9 out in the mid-Atlantic, um, I contacted uh, the owner, Fred, and I was like, Fred, is it okay if we say the word vagina? <laughs> and he's like, yes, F FCC is okay. But I was telling Kim about that, and you had an interesting response. Yeah, I think so. I, I early on in my business, so I've been doing this for quite some time. I, and I started out thinking, okay, I'm creating a bit of a niche here. I'm going a little bit outside the norm. And I hired a PR person to at the time I was selling actually one pelvic floor product. So that's kind of how I got into this line of work. So I hired a PR person to try to help get the awareness out. And I was consistently shut down from radio stations and from news channels from TV from anything because the word vagina was considered inappropriate and they said you know what if little ears are listening and it it was really quite maddening because it's a body part it's a it's an it's an, an anatomical term and I think we are doing our children a disservice if we are not talking about all the parts of our body and why if we can point our nose and our elbow and our fingers out and name them why can't we use the proper anatomical terms for vagina or for penis and so i've worked really hard to try to overcome that taboo it's a it's probably vagina is one of the least favorite words in <laughs> in the world um there's a lot of taboo there's a lot of shame a lot of embarrassment around it but part of the reason i think is because it's not talked about we use code words or we hush hush and um, so I really wanted to uh, step boldly into trying to change that. So I, I use the word as my handle, as my website, as my everything, and um, make, make people a little bit uncomfortable. But I think that's okay because it, it needs to start with, with being a bit uncomfortable. And hopefully that will be the impetus for change for how we move forward. Well, it's so interesting you say that because raising my two girls, my two daughters, when they were going to preschool, the headmaster, the lady who ran the, who runs the preschool, she was adamant about teaching the children the correct terms, you know, teach your kid, it is vagina, don't name it, like let them know. Yeah. And I thought, okay, that's really good. <laughs> but that's why I'm so excited that you're here. You are a vagina coach, but could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you get involved? Like what led you to becoming a vagina coach? Yeah, certainly not something that I, I dreamt of. You know, I didn't have aspirations when I was a little girl to, to grow up and do what I do. I didn't even, I had no concept. However, it was when I was young that I saw a childbirth video in sex education in sixth grade. And that sort of put a bit of fear, but also fascination into my brain. And I went home and I looked at my mom a little differently. And I looked at my aunt and my grandmas and I said, okay, well, they've all done it but I don't think it's something that I want to do. So I sort of grew up thinking I was never going to have children. And then when I decided I did want to start a family, I was really determined to have a different story than my mom. So I had been curious along the way, asked my mom, found out she had had episiotomies for her birth. So that's where they cut the perineum to, it was standard practice at the time to increase space, thinking it would help, help the, the birth. Um, she had incontinence, she had chronic back pain, she had a tummy that would never flatten. And so I sort of looked at pregnancy and birth as something that really did a number on, on the female body. And I really enjoy fitness and movement and I didn't want anything to get in the way of that. So for a while, wasn't gonna have kids, but then I decided that I wanted to have children and was determined to have a different story. And I was using midwives and I asked them, you know, what, what else can I do to have a different story. I said, like, should I have a cesarean? And so I started educating me, myself about that. And in the end, I, I found out about a product. My midwives had told me about this biofeedback device made in Germany called the Epino. And the term Epino stands for no episiotomy. So the intention is really that it helps prevent tearing. And so I researched this product, 
purchased one and had a great experience. And I know that I had many things working in my favor, but I feel like the product definitely played a role. So I contacted them and said, hey, can I be a distributor in Canada? And my intention wasn't for it to be a business. I just thought I'll have this little side gig and I would refer it to friends and that would be it. So long story short, it became a business. And I initially started out with a, a website with products for pelvic health because I recognized that it was a conversation that wasn't being had and pregnancy and birth are like incredibly incredible contributors to pelvic floor dysfunction and challenges. So I thought if we can start the conversation in pregnancy and help people be aware and prepare for their birth and recover more optimally, maybe that would play a role in reducing the number of challenges. So that's how it started. And I had a website for a while. I formed a second business with two other women called Belly Zinc, and we manufactured a postpartum recovery wrap and exercise program to help people heal more optimally. And then as I progressed through different stages and my kids were aging and, you know, now I'm, I'm pretty much in menopause, not quite, but almost. And I recognize that this conversation really spans our life, our, our whole life. It's not just a quick fix. It's not just something you do while you're pregnant. It really is something we need a lot more attention paid to. So that's how it started. And, and this is where I'm at now. <laughs> well, that is great. Well, you know, you mentioned pelvic health. So what exactly is pelvic health? So the, the pelvic floor is getting actually a lot more press, so to speak, than it used to. But the pelvic floor is a, a group of muscles that closes off the base of our pelvis. So male and female anatomy, we all have a pelvis. In female anatomy, we have a bit wider pelvis. We have uh, an extra opening. So we have a vagina. We have an anus. We have a urethra. There's three layers of muscles in the pelvic floor. They attach to our pubic joint or our pubic bone at the front, the tailbone. And if you, if you sit on a hard surface chair, sometimes you might feel a bit of a bony point in each butt cheek and those are called your sits bones. So they, those four points are attachment points for that group of muscles. The first two layers are primarily responsible for closing openings. So they help manage our continence and play a role in our sexual response. And the third layer is primarily responsible for organ support. So bladder, uterus, rectum. The pelvic floor muscles also play a role in our pelvic and spinal control and stability. So the, the pelvic floor is actually the foundation of our core. And we've all heard about core exercise and the pelvic floor really needs to be included in that conversation. Um, and the pelvic floor also plays a role. So it works with the diaphragm. So every time we breathe, the pelvic floor is moving with our diaphragm. And that creates kind of like a sump pump action where it's helping move lymph and, and helps with circulation in the body. So really important jobs and a lot of them but it's a part of the body that never gets talked about and no one really tells us anything about it. And I feel like the, would, that we could do a much better job educating when we start talking about menstruation, when we talk, start talking about sexual wellness, we could introduce the concept of the pelvic floor, both in male and female, but, but kind of present this powerfully to people in, in early, you know, usually it's presented like you're gonna, have a period and you're gonna have cramps and you're gonna and it's kind of like no oh, like that sounds terrible and if we present it as this amazing thing and all these superpowers you have because you have all these amazing fluctuating hormones you can grow babies birth them you are you know it, presented in a way that gives people this excitement and also maybe plants a seed that it's a part of the body we should be paying attention to and then once we become sexually active introduce the role of a pelvic floor physical therapist. So I'll talk more about those, but I, I kind of look at it as from a young age, we're told to brush our teeth twice a day, floss and see a dentist once or twice a year. We've can be, been conditioned. We are just told that that's just the way that it is. And we do it and we see our dentist and we go, even if we have no symptoms, no toothache, no nothing, we just go. And I think that we would benefit from the same with our pelvic floor. If we, again, present it as a part of the body that is really, really important and we need to pay attention to it. And that once you become sexually active, there's these amazing practitioners, pelvic health physical therapists that you will see once a year. And they help ensure that those muscles are still able to do all the jobs that they are, they are designed to do for the lifespan. Well, so I want to ask you about that because you talk about seeing these experts after you have sex, 
But I want to go, you mentioned earlier that it's when we, you know, have our cycles and it's like going to the dentist and the eye doctor. So we have so our, we have tied our pelvis, we have tied our vaginas to sex and their, their anatomy. Yes, they are used for that, but they're also not. (laughs) So And in midlife, you know, we're at different stages with sex, you know, we no longer are having babies. So the estrogen's not there. Um, Some people might be divorced, um, you know, and, you know, I have a friend who says a lot of women feel switched off from the waist down. So all of this life changes and with our pelvis, I almost sometimes wonder, can we have a healthy pelvis? Can we have a healthy vagina without worrying about sex? And then we can bring the sex part in. But, you know, I, again, I want it because I feel like when you bring the sex part in, then that's the taboo. Then that's when people are like, oh, you know, and then they, you know, they get whisper and, you know, and in midlife, people will talk about giving birth. People will talk about having a baby, but they won't talk about the changes that we're having at menopause, you know, that our periods are stopping and all of that. So I kind of want to talk about this and not make it the taboo sex talk. Does that make sense? That actually like, let's just make this also healthy. I want women to know they don't have to have bladder leakage, you know, there is a way around that. So I don't know if any of that makes sense to you, but you know, (laughs) I want to talk about, you know, I want to talk about having a healthy vagina without having it just always be tied to sex, but just actually having a healthy vagina, if that makes a little more sense. Yeah. And the reason, the reason I say once you start having sex is because it's a, it's an in, when you see a pelvic floor physical therapist, it is an internal evaluation and treatment. And so there needs to be, there's, you know, young, younger people who have not had sex can absolutely go see a pelvic floor physio. So there are some who will treat children and typically the parent is there accompanying it, but because it's a bit of an intimate type therapy, usually the point at which somebody may be um, introduced to them would probably coincide with that time frame. But that doesn't mean that you have to have had. So there's people who may have never had sex and they're 30, 40, 50 years old. Um, there's people who have never given birth or been pregnant before who can also benefit from a pelvic floor physical therapist. So it doesn't just, sex is one piece and sex can play a role in a healthy pelvic floor but it doesn't have to be the overriding. I I know exactly what you mean that it is. And a lot of people come to me for advice about sex, even though I'm not a sexual wellness professional, but knowing that the pelvic floor has a direct relationship to sexual response, it is something that needs, it deserves attention and, and to be talked about. But the other pieces in there, that's one element. We also have, uh, so core function and confidence, we also have, so confidence and continence. So continence is where it's our, our capacity to retain or hold our urine and our gas and our stool. So the pelvic floor plays a direct role in, I call it decision-making. So it, it's, it's like it, it knows or it, it should be able to help us distinguish what wants to come out of our body right now. Is it gas, is it stool or is it urine? And And so we need to know which one. And then we also need to make the decision, okay, is it appropriate for it to come out? Am I sitting on the toilet in a bathroom right now? Or am I in an elevator with a bunch of people? Or am I on a podcast? Or am I giving a presentation? Like those aren't times where you want to need that to happen. Um, So the pelvic floor muscles play a role in the the response of the muscles. So the, the, the sensation of what wants to happen and also the ability to either stop it or allow it. And... So light bladder leakage is used in many different advertisements and that is incontinence. You can call it light bladder leakage, you can call it peezing, you can call it sneeze pee, you can call it all the different names, but the term is incontinence. When, when urine comes out of your body and you don't want it to, it's incontinence and it can happen to teens, it can happen to people who've never given birth, it can happen 
for the first time when you're approaching menopause, it can happen at any stage in your life. And it is very, very treatable. It is not something you need to accept as normal. It's not something that you need to just say, well, the commercials say that it's just part of being a woman or because I'm getting older or because I've given birth or all those, those things. So, um, but optimizing the function of the pelvic floor muscles is a key component to overcoming those challenges. And then there's also um, organ support that I talked about. So there's something called pelvic organ prolapse which statistically is actually more common than incontinence, even though incontinence seems more common because it's maybe talked about a bit more. Statistically, organ prolapse is more common. So one in two women will experience some form of organ prolapse. And statistically, it's about third, between 30 and 40% of women, well, people with incontinence. The organ prolapse is when the bladder, uterus, and or rectum shift out of their optimal position and they can create bulges into either the front wall or the back wall of the vagina, or in the case of the uterus, the uterus can start to descend into the vagina. So a lot of people will maybe say, my bladder is, or my uterus is falling. So it's, it's often, that's sometimes a term that is used similar to the sneeze pee or peezing. They may hit, hit, say that their bladder is falling. And again, this is something that is um, treatable. It's not always reversible. So incontinence can be reversible. Organ prolapse is not always reversible. But if we catch it early enough, then we have an opportunity to absolutely prevent it from getting worse, potentially improve it, and maybe even reverse it. So that's another reason why I recommend seeing a pelvic floor physical therapist once a year as a check-in. So kind of like we screen for cavities, they screen for the development of prolapse, or if anything might be contributing to the incontinence that we could get a handle on and start addressing. Are there any symptoms for the prolapse? Is there anything that you can tell like, oh my goodness, I really need to get this checked? Yeah. So there's one, some would, would make you think of the pelvis and there's other ones that would make you wouldn't, you wouldn't even think. So the most common one is low back pain. Mm -hmm. And the majority of people in the world have had low back pain at some point in their life. And there was a recent study by a Canadian researcher who looked, uh, it was a group of women who had low back pain. And in her study, 95.3% of the women with low back pain also were found to have some form of pelvic floor dysfunction with it, incontinence and prolapse being in there. So they're very correlated. And most people would say, you know, my, my low back pain may not be tied to the pelvis, could be something else, but they see massage therapy, chiropractors, acupuncture, a regular physiotherapist. But again, if we could, could lump the pelvic floor physical therapist in there, it's, it's so many people have a resolution of their back pain when they address the pelvis and the function of the pelvic floor muscles. So that's one common symptom. Other ones could be some people just say, you know, I feel like there's something in there. I feel like there's something in my vagina. Or some people may say, I feel like I'm sitting on a ball. Or they may have discomfort with sex. Or they have difficulty inserting a tampon or a menstrual cup. Or maybe they can put it in, but then it starts to get pushed out. Um, they may have difficulty starting the flow of urine. Constipation is another one. Um, maybe incomplete emptying can be another one. So in the case of when the bladder is, uh, have a, a, when you have a bladder prolapse, it creates a little bulge in the anterior, the front wall of the vagina and urine can get trapped in there. In the case of the rectum, if the rectum is bulging into the posterior wall, it creates a little pocket and stool can get trapped in there. So for those reasons, it can be, it can make emptying more challenging. And so they may be more prone to constipation or straining, or they may feel like they don't quite get everything out because stuff can get struck, can get trapped in those little pockets. Oh, that is fascinating. I had no idea. So I'm so glad we're having this conversation. <laughs> and when it came to, you know, I've heard very commonly that if you want to have good pelvic health to do Kegels. So do Kegels really work? Kegel exercises are one form of pelvic floor exercise. And yes, they can absolutely play a role in optimizing the function, but they need to be done correctly. So the challenge with Kegels is they are very often prescribed, but they're very rarely taught. And different people 
may need to focus on a different element of a Kegel exercise. So most people interpret or think of Kegels as just a squeeze. Mm -hmm. And it's often presented as use the muscles that you would stop the flow of urine. And so then people think of squeezing. And sometimes, especially if people are already dealing with incontinence, they are often squeezing their legs together. So they're using their inner thighs or sometimes they may be using their glutes. And those muscles could be kind of contributors, I would say, but the, the pelvic floor is, a, a Kegel exercise should not be done by the, the glutes or the inner thighs. It needs to be done by the pelvic floor muscles. So again, pelvic floor physical therapists, they are the kind of, my opinion of the gold standard in terms of learning how to do them correctly, but visualization can be really helpful. So I have a video on my YouTube channel called the core breath and I walk through different visualizations using, I have a vulva puppet that kind of gives people an image of what may be happening because it's a group of muscles we don't see. You can't necessarily go stand in front of the mirror like we do with our bicep and you know contract and relax our pelvic floor. So um, pelvic floor physio physical therapy, if you can, there's also biofeedback devices on the market that can help if you don't have access to a physio. But I always say, if you're going to, if you're thinking of purchasing a pelvic floor biofeedback device, invest in a physio first, if you can, and then see, and then potentially use one of the devices like the Perry Fit or the LV. So a Kegel exercise is basically a closure. So kind of a coming together or drawing together of the, a lift and then a let go. So that's the, the range of motion that your pelvic floor muscles would go through. But again, most people think of it as just a squeeze and they may often hold their breath or they may bear down. And so many people think that Kegels don't work because they're not doing them correctly. So again, if we can get people first and foremost to be doing them correctly, then they can absolutely play a role and they can make change quite quickly. So within a week or two, people can start to notice improvements Maybe they don't, um, they can suppress the urge more frequently. They don't leak as much. And, um, you know, and then within another couple of weeks, if they're consistent, so that's the other piece, you have to be to do them consistently. They're not just a quick fix. And then my, my last point on that, I kind of have a three C approach. So do them correctly, do them consistently and do them coordinated with movement. So this makes it easy with the consistency piece. Once you've learned how to access your pelvic floor muscles and do Kegels, you can bring them into movements like a squat or a lunge or a bicep curl or a push up, like all sorts of movements. If you can act, bring your pelvic floor activation into there, then you are, you're basically turning many exercises into a core exercise because Kegels are a core exercise. Um, but you can, some people, they can lift heavier. Um, they feel less discomfort, maybe in a specific joint that may be bothering them in certain movements. And, that kind of you know, makes it a bit more dynamic because things like leaking or sensations of heaviness in the pelvis with prolapse don't occur when we're sitting down or when we're lying down or when we're brushing our teeth, which is often when people say to do your Kegels. They usually those happen when we are lifting weights, when we are maybe, if we have children, maybe we have young children, or maybe it's um, you know now that we're approaching menopause and our estrogen levels are declining. And it happens when we go out for a golf game with our friends, right? It's when we're dynamic. So we need to train the pelvic floor dynamically with our Kegel practice. That makes sense. Now I've heard people do Kegels when they're going to the bathroom, when they're urinating, they'll like stop it and then pee a little bit and then stop it. Is that, does that work? No, no. <laughs> she's shaking her <laughs> head. No. <laughs> so that's a, that's a, a test. So once in a blue moon, if you would like to test and see if you can stop your flow of urine, go for it. But it's not where you want to practice. If we stop and start the flow of urine that interrupts with the normal elimination process and it can contribute to urine being trapped. Um, it can contribute to infection and it starts to interfere with, again, that normal elimination process. So once in a blue moon, give it a try and see, but your practice should happen off of the toilet. And one thing I forgot to mention earlier is when I was talking about biofeedback devices that people can purchase, we have a free biofeedback device, which is our own fingers. If we have a partner, our partner has fingers. If the partner happens to be male, that partner will have a penis. 
those are all biofeedback devices. So we can insert a, one or two fingers into our vagina and do, so a, a common cue that I give to people is imagine picking up a blueberry with your vagina and your anus. So there's a gentle, there's a gentle hug of your fingers. There would be a gentle kind of drawing up and then there would be a release of that. So if you can feel that on your fingers, your own biofeedback, that can give you a good indication. So for people who may not have access to a pelvic floor physical therapist, that's one thing that you can do on your own to see if you may be doing them correctly. That is, that's helpful. Now you mentioned a, par a parafit. What exactly is that and does it work? Perifit is a device that is quite heavily marketed on social media. I get questions about it almost every single day. And it is, um, it's about the size of a pen, maybe a little bit smaller, like lengthwise of a pen. And it sort of looks like, um, it has like, it's sort of ridged almost. It has a few little lumps on it and it's, it's tubular shape and it's inserted into the vagina. And so you can kind of imagine it like a bit of a tampon that has a bit of um, like bulbs on it almost. And it's attached to sensors that are, are linked to an app on your phone. And what happens is when you have that inserted into the vagina and when you're performing Kegels, so when you do that, you know, pick up the blueberry or you can imagine with that device inside you, you could imagine hugging it and trying to draw it deeper into you then what will register ideally on the app is they have kind of like video games for your pelvic floor. So you, it may be, you know, you have to jump over mushrooms or you have to catch birds that are flying in the sky. So it, it helps you see when you are contracting and, and lifting. And it also sees when you let go, but it helps you also see the patterns of you starting to build up more strength or more endurance. Cause initially you may not be able to get over that mushroom. And as you build up your strength and endurance, then you can make it over. And then you can also have more coordination to be able to do that more quickly than you were before, or maybe you're able to hold. So there's different elements. There's we need the pelvic floor to be able to react quickly for when we laugh, cough, or sneeze, but we also need it to kind of have a, the endurance piece. So kind of long, slow holds and, uh, and the, the video game aspect can be very interactive, but also educational for people who want to see what's happening with their pelvic floor muscles. Yeah, that does. That helps us have a little more of a visual and it's kind of fun. It's like a game. So maybe you'll want to do yeah. it more too. So <laughs> that's kind of interesting. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the, okay. Thank you for helping explain that. Now in midlife, we have a lot of dryness going on, you know, with the us losing estrogen and other hormones, we can be really dry. And that includes our vaginas can be very dry and that can lead to uncomfortable sex. So I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about um, vaginal dryness and also, you know, having enjoyable sex. Yeah, super, super common. And it's, it's very closely tied to the decline in estrogen. So the, the tissues in the walls of our vagina and our bladder within our pelvis love estrogen. And when we are no longer producing it or as the levels are starting, the production levels are starting to decline, we may start to notice dryness, irritation, discomfort. Um, some people even experience a bit of bleeding with sex or it's uncomfortable. It feels like um, burning pain sometimes, or maybe they don't know so much during, but maybe it's after, but not even with sex. Some people just notice that they just feel irritated through the day as they move. And, um, and that's really because we don't have as much estrogen and our tissues love it, but then they start to, um, a great physio that I know, she uses the term, the walls of the vagina when, when we have lots of estrogen circulating are sort of like a pleated skirt. So there's, there's little ruffles almost. And then once we don't have the circulating estrogen, the tissues become more like a pencil skirt. So instead of a pleated skirt, they're more like a pencil skirt where it's a bit more narrow and straight and we've lost those, the, the, the rude, they're called. Um, and that can narrow. Sometimes people may have heard the term atrophy or dryness. Now there's one term called genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which is a really big term. So GSM is the short version of that. 
but it's basically talking about the increases in UTIs, the increases in incontinence mm -hmm. and the dryness kind of all lumped into one category and they're all kind of interrelated in there. So knowing that estrogen plays a key role, we can harness the power of estrogen with potentially local estrogen therapy. So that's where we, we would insert either with a cream or a pellet um, estrogen into the vagina. And that can be really, really beneficial, even for people who may be concerned with systemic estrogen, um, putting it locally into the vagina really doesn't go systemically. But I invite people to read a book called The Estrogen Fix and also Estrogen Matters. I think all vagina owners should read those books, um, ideally before menopause. So sometime in the perimenopause phase, like in our early 40s, I think they were a really great read. So that's one thing we can do. If hormones are not your thing, we can also look at, uh, there's a great cream by a doctor in the States, um, Dr. Anna Kabeca, she's an OB gynecologist, and she has created a, um, an amazing cream that is um, DHEA, which is, is non-hormonal, but can contribute to the production of estrogen and testosterone. And it's applied to the vulva and the entrance to the vagina each night. And that's called Jolva, I think I said it, but um, that's a great option. The other is hyaluronic acid. So we, many people spend hundreds of dollars, maybe even thousands of dollars on skin moisturizers and serums and treatments at, at Medi spas and um, you know, facial clinics around, around the world many of them have hyaluronic acid in them. So hyaluronic acid is something that we produce in our body and it has the capacity to retain a huge amount of moisture. And as we age, we produce less and therefore we start to experience dryness all over our body. And lots of people, again, we're putting them mm -hmm. on our face or elsewhere, but we can benefit from it in our vaginas as well. So nightly we can insert Usually it's a cream, but sometimes you can get little ovules as well that you just insert into the vagina and you go to sleep. And it helps the tissues retain more moisture, but it also helps heal already dry, irritated tissue. So that's a fantastic option. There's one website that I'm, I'm not tied to that I promote. It's called moisturizeyourvagina.com. And it has a very clean hyaluronic acid and vitamin E. That's it, two simple ingredients, and it is so many people's lives for the better. So daily comfort, but also um, sex has become much more as, as, as they can accommodate it again. They can experience pleasure again, enjoy without the pain and the dryness and the irritation. So, um, so all of those can play a role, but there's also nutrition in there. So both of us know Marianne Stewart. She talks a lot about the benefit of nutrition and making sure that we have the foods that can naturally fill the estrogen receptors. So flax, um, soy products, and she talks about red clover as well. And her book, Manage Your Menopause Naturally, is a really great resource for the nutrition piece because we can't overlook that as well. There's hope. <laughs> That's what I yes, think is so is. nice is it's just education, right? It's like knowing that. And you have, and Marianne, I just adore. Yes, she is my, my, one of my inner circle and she's fantastic. So thank you for mentioning her. Um, now yes. you have something called the 28 day buff muff challenge, which I love the yeah. title. <laughs> what, what is that yeah. challenge? So I, again, when you're doing kegels correctly, when you do them consistently, when you do them coordinated with movement, you can really make remarkable change in a short period of time. And I wanted to introduce the option of people to show them that it wasn't just go home and do your Kegel exercises or do Kegels at every red light or while you brush your teeth, that we can incorporate this into already existing type full body workouts. So the, the challenge is 10 minutes a day and it's not sitting and doing different, you know, 15,000 different types of Kegels. It's you learning how to do your Kegels or your core breath, as I talked about, and then bringing it into movements like a bridge or squats or lunges or bird dogs, or I have some other ones in there you probably haven't seen before in typical fitness, but it's meant to give you um, a, an introduction to my philosophy. And, and I believe that the muscles are like any other muscle in our body. They, does, they like to go through their full range of motion. Sometimes we hold on to more tension. So we need to release tension and we need to relax and do some stretching and release work. 
And then we need to activate and we need to move those muscles in various ranges of motion and various types of positions so that we, we train it to work and respond dynamically or appropriately to whatever it is that we're, we're doing or participating in. So that's, it's, it runs the first Tuesday of every month and um, it incorporates a little bit of that gamification. So when we talk about the Perry Fit in that video game, you won't be playing video games with your pelvic floor, but you, every day you, you open up your app, you've got a couple of videos to watch. You have, you know, a checklist almost that gives you the, the satisfying ding that you've completed it. And there's a, um, you get points and you can unlock bonus content. And then there's also a chat function where people can connect with others and feel like they're not alone in their, in their journey, but also ask me questions like, Hey, Kim, I can't do this because my knee hurts or I can't, what do I do instead of this? And so it's kind of like I'm your, your personal trainer through, through the challenge. And it sort of sets the tone. Uh, most people by week two have noticed a remarkable difference improvement. And then by the end, the majority of people are, you know, either less symptoms or no leaking or they, they've ditched the pads and then they're, they're set on that path that hopefully they keep up with for life. Oh, Kim, this has been amazing. This is just so educational and really, you know, a topic we need to talk about. So thank you so much for coming on the show. How can people get in contact with you? Um, my website is vaginacoach.com. And basically, if you put vagina coach into Google, you'll find me <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> so I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook, um, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on all the, the major channels. I'm not, I'm not on TikTok yet, but I don't know <laughs> if I'll, I'll be there or not. But I also wanted to say, I do have a private Facebook group called Box Talk. And the reason it's private is because sometimes we don't want to be talking about, the people don't want to comment in a public forum um, on social media. So this is a safe private place where people can come in again and connect with others. I do a weekly live Q and A um, and there's, you know, there's over 1500 people in there that also share. And so when they ask a question, they'll get the input of all the other people who may have gone through that or who may be going through it or, or maybe haven't, but are learning about what they can be doing from a preventive perspective. So, um, so I would love to welcome you in the community there too. That's great. And we'll be sure to put all the links in the details. So Kim, thank you so much for just being on the show, for doing what you do. And we just appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. And um, yeah, I, I think the, any opportunity to help spread the word is, is something that I welcome. And I know this was a bit out of your comfort zone, but you did fantastic. And I really appreciate it. <laughs> That you that you did and that you're helping educate the others because um, that's how we'll change the world is by talking absolutely have a great day thanks so much michelle